Welcome to Insight. Today we're chatting with Susan Fisher Sterling, Director of the National Museum of Women in the Arts. Susan has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Susan, for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. So you run a very unique institution. Talk about this museum and its place in the museum world. The National Museum of Women in the Arts, where I've been for, oh, I'd say the past 29 years, uh, is the only museum in the world totally dedicated or solely dedicated to women's creative achievements. Uh, it was founded by Wilhelmina Cole Holiday and her husband Wallace in 1987, and next year we'll celebrate our 30th anniversary. Women, of course, have been producing art forever, and over the last centuries there has been a, an active trade in the art market. Talk about the special challenges that women have faced. One of the reasons that the museum was founded by Wilhelmina Holliday is because of the fact that women have always faced tremendous challenges uh, when it comes to being involved in the arts. We often say that Anonymous was a woman. Any work of art that we see from the past that doesn't have a name to it could have been produced by a woman, and that's particularly true in the craft areas. So in some ways, the biggest difficulty is understanding that when women succeeded as artists, in the 16th century through the 19th century, it really was because they were of such exceptional talent that they couldn't be ignored. And that would be true for everyone from Lavinia Fontana, who is the earliest artist in our collection, who worked for one of the Bolognese popes, uh, to Vigée Lebrun, who worked for Marie Antoinette, and then Catherine the Great, uh, two great monarchs of Europe, all the way up to Frida Kahlo, who oftentimes in her lifetime stood in the shadow of Diego Rivera, but then obviously now has somewhat surpassed him in reputation. When we come to the present day, you have artists as diverse as Judy Chicago and Faith Ringgold, all the way up to Cindy Sherman or Dana Schutz or Peter Coyne, Louise Nevelson, etc. And these women really have begun to move into their own. But as uh, one of my uh, colleagues in the arts, Mira Rubel, often says, it's going to take another hundred years because women are just getting started. How do you see the work of your museum to not only expose the art, but also the social movement that is part and parcel of this area of art? The real issues that confront uh, us uh, at the Women's Museum are those of oppression and the uh, privilege and power. Uh, those are the key factors that women were um, fighting against it, or were subject to over the many uh, last few centuries. But also now, it's really interesting to see the way that women artists have broken free of the barriers that used to be seen as the fine arts, have brought textiles, uh, ceramics, photography, installation art. Uh, really, Louise Nevelson is one of the earliest uh, women to, w earliest artists to uh, create installation art in 1959. And you just see how women have been able to dismantle the patriarchy, if you will, in the arts by taking that step toward other media. So as you plan out your exhibitions and your, your programs, are there certain themes that you follow? How do you think about your exhibition schedule and your education schedule? When we, uh, when we think about our exhibition schedule at the museum, uh, one of the key characteristics is we really look to try and show a diverse group of artists. Very often we look for talents who are not well known. Uh, for example, one of my first shows before I, when I was a curator was The Art of Carrie Weems. Well, Carrie Weems, 25 years later, is very famous and one of the best known socially conscious artists in the U.S. now. But when I showed her, it was her first museum show, and I had to pull teeth with her to get people to take the show as a traveling exhibition. We have, over the last uh, almost 30 years, our shows are really 20% women of color, and that's pretty remarkable compared to what most other institutions do. We also tend to do a lot of thematic exhibitions, working with great curators, but it's hard to get press for those kinds of shows because people don't readily understand themes. They always want a Jackson Pollock show or a Pablo Picasso show, but if we give you a Bailey Lou exhibition or a Sonia Clark exhibition, you can count your 
uh, stars that in another 10, 15 years those people will become better known. So we think of ourselves as that um, vehicle almost in between the galleries and other museums where we're still seeking out great talent and we're showing those women artists to the world for the first time. How are your collections organized? Are they organized by era, by topic area? If you look at other museums, you have different collection philosophies. Very often, collections in encyclopedic museums are, are organized by geography or uh, ethnography and, and era. Um, you have a very interesting problem to solve because almost any way, and this is true for any museum, but almost any way you organize your collection will be do justice and injustice simultaneously to the place of that object in the arts world. Well, anyone who uh, knows about women in the arts uh, understands that we're at a slight disadvantage when it comes to history, uh, especially when you are, we are mostly an institution that collects the fine arts, even though we show all the other uh, artistic disciplines, including having programs uh, in music and theater. Right. So we're, you know, it's a broad spectrum that we need to cover the landscape is big, but it's a social as well as an artistic landscape where women have not been able to feature as prominently as they should. Okay, so to your question about how. The, real, the really important thing for us, I believe, is to uh, slice and dice our collection diff differently than most places. A very modern approach. It's, it's very much if you take a look at how information is absorbed in this mobile and internet age, mm -hmm. people do slice and dice information in that way. Right, and we're uh, going to allow people to curate their own projects with us, as many museums are trying to do now. But we start off, in fact, with our founder, who has cr just created a founder's tour, where people can understand where she came from when she created the museum and what some of her favorite works are. But more importantly, I think I caught into Nick Sirota's idea about having core collections. Um, it's something that I was listening to Neil Benezra yesterday at Miami Basel, and he also was talking about the difference between San Francisco MoMA's collections, which are core, deep collections of key artists, uh, versus, say, uh, an encyclopedia modern museum like the Museum of Modern Art. I'm much more on the side of the core collection idea, but I have another uh, thought that I am going to in institute as we move toward our 30th anniversary. And that's a feminist model. And that model is that of sharing. There are so many collectors out there who have great works by women. There are collectors who collect only women. There are collectors who collect a predominance of women. And there are collectors who have that one great work by a woman artist that you just have to have. And we're going to move into a lending sharing uh, mode, I believe, in the future, because I don't think everybody should own everything that they have. I'm going to go against AAM guidelines, <laughs> and I, I think we need to think out of the box about how you make a collection dynamic. Gender has loomed very large in this recent political season, and there are debates that go on about how scarce resources ought to be invested. How do those debates unfold in your institution? We can be a beacon or a light. I like to think of us that way, shining a light in Washington on women in the arts. But I also believe that advocacy is key uh, when you are with uh, working in another museum, if you're a curator or if you're a guard um, or if you're a collector. I think all people can stand up for uh, women in the arts. And one of my favorite ideas is one that was given by McCall Hebron recently. She said, when you go into another museum and you see a work of art by a woman, make a big deal about it. Talk about it loudly within the gallery. And then people might start to take notice. Now, that's a very simple activity, if you will. But I think that the more that we, as the Women's Museum, can help people to understand that they can go to their own museums and do their own tallies, or that we could do a study about gender inequality in the arts, which would also deal with the issues of diversity, the farther we can really push the dialogue forward. And that's a goal for the future. Wonderful. Well, Susan Fisher-Sterling, thank you so much.
for spending time talking about the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, D.C., which I'll have to visit. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>